When it comes to JRPGs, most have their own home for them, whether it's PlayStation, PC, or even on Nintendo. A lot of people like to play their RPGs on the same system. It just feels right, and there's no need to readjust to a different controller depending on the game, you know? However, because of this and a multitude of other reasons, I think there are some banger games that unfortunately end up as hidden gems and never really reach the sales figures I know they could with proper marketing and discoverability. One of those hidden gems is the world ends with you. This game surprised me to say the least. Granted, I've known about this game for a long time now, but I definitely didn't play it when it was new. I was first introduced to the game through a let's play on YouTube around 10 or so years ago, but because in all honesty it was kind of low quality, I didn't really stick with it, making it kind of fade from my memory. Fast forward some years later when Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance was releasing, where that game had the main cast of the world ends with you make an appearance. That's when my previous memories kind of started coming coming back to where I promised myself that I would play it because I liked the roles they played here. And after that, well, the rest is history. I had no idea this series would become one of my all time favorites. The story, the characters and the world they've crafted here is something I truly think every fan of the genre should experience. And that reminds me, if you're a major fan of RPGs, especially ones from Square Enix, then I'd appreciate if you subscribe to the channel. 90% of people who actually watch the videos aren't actually subscribed and yada yada. You've heard this from so many other creators, so I'm sure you get it by now, but you might as well help your boy out at the same time, you know? But anyways, back to the world ends with you. The game was developed by Square Enix alongside Jupiter, who had previously helped Square develop Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories on the Game Boy Advance. And it's funny, because in that video, I mentioned that same fact. Who knew I'd be diving back into their work so soon? But similar developers aren't the only thing those two games have in common. The world ends with you's combat was actually inspired by Chain of Memories. That may seem hard to believe especially with how different they are, but the inspiration itself can be easier to spot taking a closer look. All attacks you can use are all dictated by what cards, or pins in the world ends with use case, that you have equipped. Using them will make them need to reload themselves after a bit, both games take place in an action environment in a 2D space, and so on and so forth. Like I mentioned before, despite not selling too hot, the reception from critics and players alike were pretty unanimously positive. I think it also helped that around this time people were getting tired of the same old same old big names from Square like Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts, so getting a new IP that's completely different from anything else at the time had to be refreshing. Also I kinda hate being that guy, but that's what these videos are for I guess. But I see a lot of people refer to this game as a Nomura game, likely because for this first title he was the lead character designer, also allowing him to step into the creative producer role for the game. But calling a game where that's his main role, his game, just feels disrespectful to the important names on the project. Am I weird for thinking that? I know nobody means to disrespect the people who made the game what it was, but I just think that Tatsuya Kondo and Tomohiro Hasegawa, the co-directors, Takashi Arakawa, the planning director, and Gen Kobayashi, another character designer alongside Nomura, and Takayuki Odachi, the background art director, also deserve just as much credit for what made this game what it is today. I just like giving credit where it's due. But moving past that, we brought it up before for a moment, but let's talk about the gameplay of The World Ends With You. So so like I said, it's a 2D action RPG. While you only start off with one, within the first hours you'll eventually find yourself with four different pins that allow you to utilize different kinds of telekinesis. Crawling fires, powerful lightning, and energy blasts are all here and accounted for. Every pin has its own cast and reload time. When going into a fight, this is vital to keep in mind, because you will certainly end up in scenarios where you can't use some attacks immediately because it requires a few seconds to initially load, though like I said, this isn't the case for all pins, but alongside those cast times, the reload times are what you need to be wary of most. Keeping an eye on your position in the battlefield is important, because most enemies will be running or flying back and forth along it, so it'll be easy for them to just take pop shots at you and will you down. Spamming your ranged attacks may seem fine at first, but not allocating for when they need to reload can get you killed if you're not careful where you're positioned. That's the basis of general combat, but the execution of your own attacks are quite varied. Some range pins will require you to tap the enemy in order to shoot your magic, and rapid pressing will rapid fire. Other pins like physical attack based ones may need you to slash horizontally, others vertically, some may even need you to draw circles, but all of these different inputs can have widely different effects during combat, so mixing and matching your attacks can really let you get the flow going. In addition to all of this, throughout the game you'll always have a partner by your side, fighting with you in battle, though depending where you're at in the game, for story reasons you'll sometimes have a different partner with you, and 
each partner controls completely different. So keeping their attack executions in mind while you play is vital because you will not beat this game without your partner. Trusting them is everything in this game. For example, Shiki is the first partner you get, and for her attacks you have to tap the enemy. But knowing this, I can also equip a pin that allows me to execute an attack with the same input as hers. So doing this, one execution will have us both attack the enemy, which really helps since battles also include the sync meter, which rises the more in sync Neku and his partner are. When this meter reaches 100%, you're able to unleash a fusion attack, which is kind of like a mini game, I guess. Each one varies depending on the partner, but I'd probably say Shiki's is the easiest, likely because hers comes first. Shiki's fusion attack has cards appear on screen, each with a different shape on them. The goal is to find two matching cards of the example shown at the top of the screen. So if a star card is shown at the top, you have to find two other star cards in order to continue. During this phase though, there's a timer, so you not only have to be fast, but precise too, since however many matches you get will determine how powerful the fusion attack will end up being. I like this a lot because there's a bit of a scramble to choose wisely while keeping an eye on the clock. I hadn't played this in a while, but it seems like my reaction time wasn't as good as it could have been, so I often got at least one or two wrong during this phase, leaving me with an attack of 3.0 to 3.8, which honestly isn't too bad. Going back to the general side of things for a second because I couldn't find a better spot to talk about this, but I love how much fashion rules things in this game. Shibuya is a popular place, with everyone trying to stick with the trends and present themselves well. That's a big point of things in a narrative sense earlier on, but it's also really important gameplay wise too. So Shibuya in this game is divided up into areas, and each of these districts all have their own different top trends and weak brands. In this game, the pins I mentioned before that you use in battle aren't the only things that are identified by the brand who makes them. The different kinds of clothes you equip on your characters are identified by them too, each of them having different effects. Though at first you won't always know what this shirt for example offers, but the more you get to know the store clerks by visiting them, checking out the merch and buying from them, the more you'll unlock what each of these clothes pieces can do, so you can more easily optimize your wardrobe for combat. Being able to synergize with what clothes you and your partners have on for optimal buffs and effects alongside with what pins you currently have equipped goes a long way for the biggest factor I'm leading up to, and that's what brand is currently trending in your area. For example, if you're decked out in clothes and pins primarily from Musratus, Hip Snake, or Dragon Kotor, and you've been in quite a few fights, then don't be surprised if you notice a prompt that tells you your attacks from those brands are double damage now, or even another kind of buff. This of course only works for those specific areas, but sometimes the game will force you to use unpopular brands and fight to make them number Number one trends. It's a really cool system that not only punishes you for not being trendy, but also rewards you for putting in the work to make something popular. I genuinely think the game would be lesser without this system. Okay, now that I've talked about that important stuff, I gotta take a minute to talk about this because this is insane. But the music in this game, bro, this game has a freaking masterpiece of a soundtrack behind it. I'm serious. This series next to Final Fantasy XIV has my favorite soundtracks from Square Enix, period. Period. There's so much variety to it. It's like you never know what kind of flow is coming up, and yet somehow it always fits with what's going on. Whether it's in the day-to-day -day fights with the noise or just exploring Shibuya in its entirety, the game flows effortlessly between rock, hip-hop, electronica, and even orchestral scores. The game even includes Japanese and English versions of a lot of the lyrical songs, and that extra effort is just so freaking appreciated because I can enjoy the same song in such a different way because of of this. I promise you it does not take long to be tapping your toes and singing along to the soundtrack in this game. I guess it also feels like a breath of fresh air because it seems less and less RPGs tend to use mostly vocal songs for their soundtracks these days. There's a type of energy that just swarms you when you start learning the lyrics over time and sing along as you play. I had to legit force myself to stop hurting y'all's ears when I was streaming through this game on Switch last year. It's that freaking good and always feels like it gets better with every listen. Honestly, a huge shout out to the whole array of people who worked to make this soundtrack as good as it turned out. All right, music tangent over. Sorry, I had to get that out of my system. But going back to pins again though, you'll eventually notice that alongside their individual level up systems, you'll see that some pins can even evolve into new ones after enough use. This is pretty incredible because the evolved pin is practically always twice as good as the original. Though I'm sure when you have limited slots, sometimes some pins are just better to use than others. We can take one of the first bosses in the game for example. He transforms into a giant noise-like creature 
and takes up a lot of the screen. Because of this, a single swing of his fist can hit you from practically anywhere besides where he's hitting from. So if he's swinging to the left, you should go right. But even though I've beaten this game numerous times, I still found myself losing to this fight because I genuinely think that due to how the control scheme of this game is, it's just slightly too clunky to comfortably evade this attack while still trying to interweave ranged and physical attacks. But as soon as I switched to all range attacks, I beat it before we even really started. It's much easier to pace your attacks when you're not worried about closing the distance and stuff. This way I'm able to get some good hits in, still dodge out of the way of his attacks, and position myself accordingly. Though, uh, I think it's about time I address the elephant in the room. So as much as it pains me to say this, this game is like Persona 3 in the sense that it has no definitive version. Every version available has its own merits and worth alongside their unfortunate downsides. The three official versions of this game is the original on the DS, the mobile remake, and the Nintendo Switch port. So let's go down the list. It's pretty obvious why it's hard to expect people to go play the DS version in 2022. Most might not even have a working DS available, and even if they did, it's also unlikely likely they have a physical copy, which Square doesn't even produce anymore. So buying one now wouldn't even give that money to the company. It'd go to whatever random guy you bought it off of from eBay. But despite this, some may take the emulation route. The DS version's combat is unlike any of the other versions. This is the true way the original creators pictured this game playing. In it, you controlled one character on each screen, both fighting at the same time. They explain it like when combat begins, the reality is split, so taking out both sides of the enemies in the battle, something like that. I didn't play too much of this version, but I do know that it's definitely more difficult at its core, because the basic Neku gameplay we've seen so far in this video is the exact same. So you have all that to worry about alongside more in-depth mechanics for your partner that you have to control. It's like playing two-player split screen by yourself. It was designed for one person, so that's why I don't feel like it's overwhelming despite it all. The mobile port and the Switch port are very similar. The combat was reworked to where each partner has a specific input Put in order to activate their attacks. So working in tandem with them is a lot easier because if tapping the phone screen on this enemy attacks for Shiki, I can have my pin of choice ensure it attacks me too. No two screens to worry about. I'm kind of surprised they went this route because other mobile ports of the DS games kind of kept the vertical perspective. Not only does it make it easier to port, but it translates to what their original design wanted the exact same. Phone screens are usually long, they're touch screen, they're portable, it just makes sense. Though this isn't a say I mind how they went about it. I'm glad they did because I'm positive it's the only reason we ended up getting a Switch port at all because again, the versions are very similar. The Switch version has two very different aspects that can't be ignored when talking about this game. The first point is that this version has new exclusive story content that directly bridges the story of this game and its sequel, Neo The World Ends With You. There was around 14 years in between both games, so adding new story for this purpose just made too much sense. This alone made this the preferable version of the game in my opinion. The second aspect is that this version when playing in docked mode, you know, the main way people play games on their TVs or monitors, you're forced to use motion controls. Now, I'm not bothered by motion controls. People these days hear motion controls and immediately think back on how bad the Wii's was at the time, but it's been developed so far since then. I play VR, so it's like a natural evolution of what the Wii was doing back then anyway, so adapting to this game's controls didn't take much, especially since they there are basically no controls to learn since it's all motion focused. Swipe down, swipe up point out an enemy and tap a button. All of this feels so much better because unlike what a lot of people think, you don't have to have your arms held up or swing your arms around like a crazy person. On screen here, you can see me laid the freak back just chilling. If I didn't tell you I was using motion controls here, I doubt you'd even notice. That's how little effort is required to play this game and play it well. This kind of turned into a in defense of motion controls video for a minute there, but I always feel the need to bring it up because I know what the general consensus is about motion controls these days. But with all this said, there is one more version of the game I didn't mention, and it's how I played it for this video. What you've seen this entire time is actually the Switch version in handheld mode on an emulator. You see, the regular Switch version in handheld mode plays the exact same as the phone version, so I didn't include it before. But I'm bringing it up here because it actually makes a difference. While through emulation you can set up motion controls, I found it much easier to just switch to undocked mode, which is just the click of a button. And because handheld mode for this game is just touch 
screen controls, it works perfectly as a PC game using the mouse. I'm serious, you only need the mouse to play it and play it well. Now, I'm not going to get into all the legality behind emulation in this video. If you still think emulation is illegal, then there are tons and tons of videos that show legal proof on why it's perfectly fine to emulate games that you dump yourself. Moving on from that again though, this is legit the best version of the game. I didn't mind the motion controls as I said. I've streamed the game all the way through like that on the channel, but nothing beats that precision of a mouse. It genuinely makes me curious why they didn't port the game to PC, especially when they ported the sequel to PC later on for the Epic Games Store. Oh, and funnily enough, the day of writing this part of the script, it was shadow dropped for Steam as well, which freaking rocks, but man, Square sucks at marketing this series. But we'll talk more about that in the Neo The World Is With You video. But yeah, if you own a copy of the game on Switch, I definitely recommend doing what you need to play it on PC. Maybe one day we'll get it natively on Steam and maybe even PlayStation and Xbox consoles too. But okay, I basically not touched on the story at all yet, and I don't usually take as long to do so. But there's a lot that needed to get talked about, so your spoiler warning comes now. The rest of the video will include footage of any point in the game, and I'll be talking about practically the entire narrative. So turn back now if you care about spoilers. We good? We're fine? They're gone? Cool, let's go. Our game begins with one Neku Sakuraba having a bad day. The guy seems pretty irritable at practically everything and everyone around him. He talks about not understanding people, wanting them to shut up and get out of his way, and that all the world needs is him. What a way to meet the protagonist of a game, am I right? Shortly after this, he awakens on the street of Shibuya in its scramble crossing. This, for one, is already weird, but he immediately becomes overwhelmed by the thoughts of everyone around him. He has no idea why this is happening or where this weird pen came from, but checking his phone it seems he's gotten some threatening sounding spam email telling him to go to the 10-4 building nearby in 60 minutes or face erasure, where right afterwards a timer is etched into his hand and he's attacked by some strange looking animal creatures. After the intro to the gameplays, we get a bit of insight into who's running this game. Switching back to Neku again, he watches in horror seeing people vanish after being attacked by these monsters. He almost gave in to despair, but a girl named Shiki tells him that if they make a pack together, they can fight off those monsters called noise. Doing so without much choice in the matter, the two team up and successfully fight off the noise. I love this cutscene before the fight because it's such a serious moment, but Neku is just kind of being an ignorant goofball because they do the whole anime thing where they kind of power up together thanks to the pact, and he's like, what's with the light show? Shiki rushes him off, but he doubles back with, but the funny lights. I don't know why this cracks me up literally every time I see it. It's so wildly out of character for him to act like this, and we know that already despite having only just met him. I don't know man, it's just funny. But yeah, after this Shiki explains that they have to play this game or else they'll be killed by the noise that attacks them since they're players. Neku is not having any of this and actively goes out of his way to be rude to her. After completing the day's task, Shiki reveals that they're stuck playing this game for 7 days and failing will have them erased. There's no way out. In the next moment, apparently it's already the next day somehow, day 2. Their new objective is to set the cursed statue free. In this moment, it starts to really show how untrusting Neku is, not only of Shiki, but everyone. He can't accept that they'd randomly fall asleep in the middle of broad daylight like Shiki was suggesting, and now it's suddenly the next day? Despite what he saw yesterday, people being erased, the noise, and the reaper. Moving on though, eventually the two meet some other players, Beat and Rhyme. Beat thinks our heroes are reapers because he can't scan them to hear their thoughts, since you can't scan reapers. But it turns out you can't scan players either. Honestly, the whole group wants to work together, share intel, make it easier for everyone to survive. But Neku just isn't having it and pushes Beat and Rhyme away. He doesn't see the point of bonds and having other people hold you back or keep you down, so having to go on without the extra help, the two solve the day's mystery goal, but this is when everything goes downhill. A reaper named Uzuki Yashiro starts to manipulate Neku's unstable emotions, promising to let him out of the reaper's game if he kills Shiki. She eggs him on by saying that she's been a spy for the reapers, thanking her for checking in so often. This makes Neku feel his suspicions were correct about her, because she's always on her phone despite despite them not being able to contact anyone outside of receiving the missions. It didn't help that Shiki wasn't able to admit what she was doing on her phone. Uzuki doubles down trying to reinforce Neku's feelings of screw everyone else, save yourself, you're the only one who matters anyway. All this while Shiki's begging Neku not to kill her. He's lifting her up in the air like he's using the force to choke her or something. And the chapter just ends there. Bro, what the freak? This is a Nintendo game. We're like an hour into this game and I'm already buckled up and locked in. 
After this though, throughout the week of the Reapers game, we start to see slight shifts in Neku's personality and his relationship with his partner Shiki. She ended up forgiving him though since she knows he was just being manipulated while in a vulnerable state. Bless her soul. But I think one of the biggest reasons I love this week is how the roles essentially reverse for these two. As time goes on, Shiki starts to change in a negative way. She becomes more absent-minded and negative with obviously a lot on her mind. This kind of throws Neku for a loop as even though he doesn't know her that well, even he can see this is nothing like her usual self. So to see Neku kind of shift into being more of a positive figure for her during this time was really cool to see, especially since we found out that Neku has selective amnesia, which explains a bit of why he was acting the way he did. He didn't know this town, he didn't know these people, and he didn't know himself, which again, why putting all that aside in order to help Shiki get through her crisis hits different. It shows how much she's beginning to mean to him, especially since, well, he literally has no one else in his life as far as he knows. To elaborate a bit on this crisis of Shiki's, everything gets flipped on its head when we see Shiki in a crowd of people, minding her own business, talking to friends. This kind of throws her worst fears in her face, and with Neku there to see it too, everything horrible just rushes to her at once, causing her to basically emotionally explode. It turns out this Shiki we see isn't actually Shiki at all, and is really her friend Eri. When the Reapers game begins, in order to play, every player has an entry fee that must pay, the thing they care about most taken from them, and for Shiki, it was her appearance. At first, this is what she felt she had always wanted. She could finally be Eri, the super talented and beautiful friend she looks up to so much, hence why she's taken on her bubbly and outgoing personality too. But in the end, she realized that looking like Eri won't change who she really is, that gloomy and lesser girl who her own friend said she wasn't cut out for being a designer like she wanted to be. But with Neku's help, she's come to really understand that her appearance really was what she treasured, but misunderstood her true feelings thanks to the fog of jealousy. Neku really opens up to her and lets her know that he likes her just the way she is. A really powerful message, man. Another highlight during this week had to do with Beat and Rhyme. Seeing an attack from a noise incoming, Rhyme sacrifices herself for Beat in order to save him, but it turns out that without a partner, he'll be dead in minutes too. Though thankfully, Mr. H is able to take him to a place where he won't lose that time he's got left, kind of giving a bit of insight into what kind of power Mr. H might be hiding in order to do this. Rhyme's death really destroys Beat. I'm not saying his emotion isn't warranted, but based on his reaction, it almost seems like more than you'd expect for people who just met. Lastly, everything comes to a head in the final day, where Neku, Shiki, and Beat are the last players alive and have to take on the Game Master, the last obstacle between them and their second chance at life. With Neku and Chiki agreeing to meet up in front of Hachiko, where he'll have to look for a girl holding the Mr. Mew plush since he won't know what Chiki will look like in her actual body. This Game Master fight is nothing special, but certainly works as an example that sometimes some pins are better for some situations. You'll have to bob and weave a lot here. Worrying about getting up close and personal to deal physical attack damage just ain't worth the risk. I put on the most conventional and strongest range attacks I could, even if I had already mastered the pin and just won the fight that way. This way, I I had no issue finding the optimal spots to stand and attack so I can have the reaction time to dodge. But after the fight, in a dark twist, it turns out only one person can come back to life and the composer chose who it'd be, and that person was Shiki. While Neku and Beat have the choice to either die here and now, become Reapers, or play the game again. While Beat unexpectedly chooses to become a Reaper, Neku of course decides to play the game again, determined to meet Shiki one day, with her saying she'll wait at Hachiko every day until he returns. I freaking love this for them, man. What a freaking 180 since the opening hours of the game. And this is still not long into things, but from here on out, things will be quite different. So week two is a strange week. Neku approaches things seriously from the get-go since he knows there's more at stake now. So it turns out since he still won the last game, his previous entry fee was returned and those were his memories, hence the explanation why he had amnesia in week one. But since he was beginning a new week, a new entry fee had to be taken. And since his memories are no longer what's most important to him, Shiki, his new most important factor of his life, is taken as the entry fee. This utterly destroys Neku.
Deku because it gives him the most conflicting feelings in the world. He cares about her, but as soon as she was finally able to get her life back with her brand new resolve regarding it, her life was snatched away again and this time he feels it's because of him. If he stuck to his guns about having bonds with others being stupid and pointless, then he wouldn't have to feel this pain and guilt. A bit of the old Neku comes out here, yet he's still determined to win the game because this time Shiki's life is on the line too now. This life isn't just his own right now. He has to win for her sake. Man, I love how much the romance in this game isn't completely in your face. They don't have to have some emotional kiss scene or holding hands or even any I love yous. You can tell by their actions and circumstances alone that they care for one another and that's just beautiful writing and direction. But in this new week, we've got our brand new partner and fan favorite, Joshua. He's quite the mysterious guy. Not only can he be scanned unlike other players, but based on how he acts, it seems like he knows a lot more about what's really going on here than he should. This does not sit right with Neku. Naturally, because of his untrusting nature, and that kind of even reflects through gameplay, with a new partner, we've got new mechanics for them. So unlike Shiki, Joshua takes things a bit forward with his input by having to swipe downward on an enemy for him to summon what's basically just junk to fall down on enemies. He definitely packs a punch too, and with this new input, it makes what pins I use need to change a bit. With Shiki, in all honesty, there's practically no reason to use physical attacks since ranged attacks alongside her will fill the fusion gauge faster since you're more likely to be in sync using the same input. Josh has me wanting to balance my physical and ranged attacks since my physical attacks are what I can use to sync with Josh better. But because ranged attacks are just really strong in this game, I don't want to completely remove them or even have less of them than physical attacks purely because of how dangerous getting close up and personal can be. Throughout the week, Neku begins to suspect him more and more. He's also getting weird flashbacks taking place in Utagawa. More and more of events become clearer as the week continues, showing that both the game master this time around, Minamimoto, and Joshua were both present when Neku was killed. Initially, Neku concluded that it was Joshua who had done it, because from what he can tell from the flashback at the time, it was clear that was the case. But it turns out he was going for Minamimoto, not him. Minamimoto being who shot Neku from the back. I really like this being what ends up happening because it lets the advice Mr. H gave Neku back in week one still hold true. Because in the end, Joshua sacrifices himself for Neku, taking a last ditch effort attack from Minamimoto. I don't know, I just have this thing when it comes to this game that Neku has such a hard time with basically everyone around him, but Mr. H was someone that Neku always felt strangely drawn to. So for his advice to hold true to the end really puts a smile on my face. Now that I think about it, this week has some of the best story moments so far. Like during week two, day four, while you're helping Triple Seven, you know, the Reaper we helped alongside Shiki in the first week, find him and his band's missing microphone. You see Sota and Now after they won the Tenpin tournament on a previous day. At first, they kind of seem like airheaded guys who aren't taking this game seriously, but man, they give Neku such solid advice that you can tell from his face alone that he truly needed. Joshua tries to scare him off by calling them out for being friendly to other players, since at the end of the day, they're not friends, they're competition. But they freaking shake it off like it's completely okay. Neku was just about to blame himself for Shiki not getting to go back to her life, but they completely sweep over it, letting him know there's no reason for him to feel guilty, because her being his entry fee means he truly cares about her. So it's not like it's his fault. For each other, they'd be willing to be entry fees if it meant the other could have another chance. They'd even play the game a million times, whatever it takes for the both of them to live in the real world or the RG again. They don't want to fight other players either, since at the end of the day, they all want to be alive again. Nobody deserves it most, after all. Everyone's got their own dreams and ideals too, none outweighing another's. This was a really powerful message. I think it really hits too if you paid attention during week one. You can actually find these two still alive just going about their business with no idea they'll be dead soon. Ah, <laughs> this game, man. But moving on now, another really big moment this week I loved was the whole story arc rivalry between Shadow Ramen and Ramen Don. Two ramen shops with polar opposite approaches to their businesses. This may sound pretty strange for a major arc that seems like it has nothing to do with anything, and in a way, you may be right, but I feel it does such a great job of fleshing out the people in this world, alongside seeing how our main characters interact with them. We don't see our heroes interact with living people often, mainly because they're invisible when not within specific buildings marked with the Reaper decal. Ramadan is ran by an older man named Ken, who, while he makes incredibly good food, he's gotten too focused on changing stuff up in order to keep his business afloat. He only has one month to start really earning profits again or else the shop will go under. However, he can also take the easy way out and accept being bought out by his rival competitor, but doing that he 
can't make his ramen with love how he's done for all these years anymore. Since these days, people don't care if the ramen is good or not. They want an experience. They want a performance when they go out. They even claim most wouldn't know what good ramen tastes like if they had it. And the thing is, they're right. Talking to the competitor's customers shows that this is true. Most are only eating at Shadow Ramen because of the spectacle and popular local celebrity Prince recommending it on his blog. However, none of them know he only did it because of contractual obligations. He hates lying to his audience and eventually stands up for what he believes in. At the end of the day, both him and Ken realize they have to remember why they set out for these careers in the first place. Ken wanted to make good ramen, and Prince wants to run his blog based on his own thoughts and feelings. Along the way, it's easy to get caught up in wanting the success or even reveling in it. You start being what the people want you to be instead of being who you set out to be. Not to say that path is necessarily wrong, but the point of it all is to learn how to determine who it is you want to be and what you need to do to be that person. Stay true to yourself no matter what. Just a nice message that I feel anyone can relate to. After all this happens, Neku and Josh start to realize that everyone's wearing those same red pins that he and Shiki promoted in the first week, and that apparently they were all designed by Cat, a celebrity Neku is a huge fan of and inspires a lot of his way of life. But the concerning part is the art on the pin is way too similar to that of the player pins, leaving the two wondering what the connection could be. Skipping back to the end of the whole microphone fiasco with Triple Seven, our two heroes end up being attacked by Beat once again, with Neku begging him to let them go since he has to win in order to save Shiki. However, that doesn't phase the new Reaper as he still unleashes his attacks with no mercy. Upon leaving them alive once again, this time Neku picks up what appears to be Rhyme's Bell that Beat had just dropped. Now determined to return it despite everything, he knows that Beat had to have a reason to join the Reapers. After making it to Utagawa, Neku talks about how he used to frequent this place after school by himself. This reminds Joss that Neku is an awful lot like Shibuya's Yuji and goes into detail about how this other plane they now exist on exists all over the place and Shibuya's UG is just one of many. Basically confirming there are Reapers games all over the world, but they all have some different rules they follow and they're impossible to travel between. That is, unless some unforeseen event occurs to that UG. I like this scene a lot because as it continues, Neku begins to question the way of life he's been living because he's done his best to live by the philosophy he learned from Cat, but he also knows that just like Mr. H said, the world ends with him. So if he opens up more to others, then maybe he can expand his world too. Later on, we find Minamimoto talking to himself and drawing some strange art on the ground. This hinting that Minamimoto has been the one creating the taboo noise they've been encountering that's killing off players and reapers alike. Making it to the cat mural, Neku scans Joshua one more time in an attempt to learn the whole truth of his death. This being where Neku believes Joshua is the one who killed him. On day five, he even confronts Josh about being the one who killed him, just giving him sly replies, neither confirming nor denying it. It's more messed up too because he kind of baits Neku into confronting him because when he does, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if Josh killed him or not. They've still got two days left and he's gonna have to work with Josh regardless. And on day seven, like I mentioned earlier, the truth came forward about how Josh didn't actually kill Neku and that it was Minamimoto the whole time, with Josh sacrificing himself to save Neku in their fight against this week's Game Master. This consumes Neku with guilt because like Mr. H said, all he had to do was trust his partner, but confronting him without all the facts likely led to this conclusion. This making Neku feel two lives couldn't be recovered thanks to his actions. Things only get worse when we continue. Neku did survive his second Reapers game, but in a twist, it turns out that Josh was actually still alive this whole time, making this attempt null and void. He's given one final chance to play the game, but this time he's all alone, his entry fee being everyone this time. With this, you can tell it's an obvious setup making things look bleak for Neku, because we know players without a partner only live for a few minutes after waking up, but it simultaneously throws both Neku and the player for a loop, because how the freak are we getting out of this? In the end, just when Neku is about to be killed by the noise summoned by Uzuki and Karya, Beat steps in and talks down to his co-workers for going along with this crappy week and attacking a defenseless player with the world against him. Not caring about the consequences, Beat makes a pact with Neku becoming his third and final partner. Beat's a pretty great partner, I'd say narratively my favorite after beating the game again for this video. His fusion attack is my 
my favorite to do too. Basically for his, a deck of cards is laid out. Yeah, we had to have Chain of Memory somewhere in this game, but with this deck, you have to pair up matching symbols. So these hearts are separated by a blue spade. So with it, I tap it to make it disappear, matching the two hearts up. This allows multiple pairs to match, dependent on the surrounding symbol placements, of course, but still. This mini game is my favorite because it's fast paced and the easiest way to hit 4.0 and above on your gauge. I even hit 6.0 plus once this time when I had never had done that before. So that made things even more memorable. However, I say all this, but Beat isn't my favorite partner to play with though. His input is kind of strange. It always ends up like this for him. I believe the input is to tap an enemy to summon him and scratch the enemy in varying directions like up and down and left and right to execute his various attacks. But sometimes it felt like I only scratched enemies and he would be summoned too. I never had a problem summoning him unless it was against the boss. Maybe I just never read his tutorial right over multiple playthroughs, but whatever, he still clutched out tons of fights. During week three, I made sure to mainly focus on enemy tap pins and scratch pins. This is the first playthrough where I got all six pin slots too. You get the first four throughout the story, but after that, five and six can be bought from stores with the right amount of Scarletite and rare metals. I could have gotten my sixth earlier, but I misread the shop I was at and just said screw it and bought something else, making when I actually found the right shop, I was one rare metal short, but it all worked out in the end. But going back to week three, this is a strange final week. This time, Konishi Kitanji's right hand was the game master, and because of this, she ends up posing a challenge to our heroes. She'll be in the same place for the whole week, and all they have to do is beat her before the week is over. But during this week, a lot of it is used to set the stage for what's truly happening to Shibuya, and we find out a ton of stuff. Like, Minimimoto is back because he actually planned to be erased by his own attack last week when he killed Joshua, because the taboo noise refinery sigil was already set up to revive him, making him a taboo reaper. It didn't go exactly as planned, but it definitely was good enough for him. We also find out that it turns out Rhyme was actually Beat's sister, but entering the game, Beat's entry fee was her memories of him, her entry fee not being revealed. But alongside this, Beat was only able to live through week one despite losing his partner thanks to Mr. H. What he did was gather Rhyme's soul and put it into a pen, having Beat partner with it in order to save him, and he decided to become a reaper so he can find a way to bring Rhyme back. But now that he's a player again and no longer a reaper, Konishi ended up stealing Rhyme's pen as Beat's new entry fee, while also letting him know that a reaper's lifespan is determined by how many points they gather on the job. But since Beat didn't gather anything, he wouldn't even make it the whole week. This all being more than enough incentive to make this week's goal to take down Konishi and get Rhyme back, with Beat wanting to go even higher and even take down the composer, taking his job so he can bring everyone back to life to be happy again. Of course, like I've said before, a lot comes into light this week, so we're not done yet. As this week continues, Neku and Beat start to realize that the person who made these red pins that are seemingly starting to mind control everyone in the RG and UG alike were made by Cat, who we know to be Mr. H. Neku is in avid denial about it, but Beat doesn't really see how it couldn't be him. We end up having to fight against the mind controlled Uzuki and Karya too. After the battle, Neku wants to erase them so they won't come after them anymore, but Beat convinces him not to because he genuinely believes they're good people inside. I like this because throughout the game, the way the characters treat Beat tries to trick you into thinking he's just a reckless meathead, and while that may be part of his character, it's certainly not the entirety of him. He's got a lot of heart in him, man. He may not be the smartest, but he's got a great read on people. He can see deeper than a lot of other characters can, and to jump the gun a bit here, Beat letting them live here let them be able to be such great assets in the next game, proving that they are good people despite being reapers just like Beat said. He's having a rough time during this game, but there's a ton of moments where you can see why his little sister cared about him so much. He's a good guy with a good heart, and that's more than what a lot of these losers in this town can say. At the end of the week in taking down Konishi in an exhaustingly long fight, we end up meeting up with Shiki again somehow in the Shibuya River? This is where she finds out she was Neku's entry fee and has the appropriate reaction knowing that shows how much Neku cares about her. Shortly after, they find Minamimoto defeated, likely by the composer, showing again how powerful they must be, but still they move onwards. They eventually confront Kitanji in a battle, in a surprisingly easier fight, but he ends up using the red pin on Shiki, forcing Neku to break her pin. The battle leaves both her and Beat unconscious, so Neku presses on alone, meeting with Kitanji again, where he reveals that the composer is not Mr. H, and that they aren't even in the UG anymore, and that he himself has been the cause of everything that's been happening, even being the one who made the red pins that were of course designed after the player pins. He did this because he wanted to erase individuality, have a Shibuya with no 
quote, strife and selfishness, turning it into a paradise. Neku rejects this ideal because those individualities are what makes Shibuya so great, a detail he couldn't notice before because he was rejecting everything around him. Shibuya is made up of these individuals, so what would be the point of saving a Shibuya that isn't itself anymore? After a short action sequence to try to control Neku, Joshua comes back just like Shiki, but is quickly used by Kitanji to morph into a snake noise, capturing his now awoken up friends too. This is the final boss, Anguish Contest. Now honestly, this fight isn't that bad. It looks crazy and there's a lot going on, but I found a sweet spot here to avoid a lot of attacks, yet dish out a good bit of damage. I also stuck with tap and scratch pins so I wouldn't have to get too close to one snakehead in order to attack. You'll eventually be able to team up with your friends for fusion attacks, but I won't lie, I kept failing them because I was bad at the timing, but I consistently got Shiki, so that's good at least. I actually had to switch things up a bit too though, because I kept getting so far, but whittling down my HP would get to me after a while. Thankfully, I got six pin slots this run, so I was able to keep four attack pins and the remaining two for a healing pin and a pin that multiplies uses for limited use pins. Healing pins are usually only able to be used once, but this pin bumped me up to three uses, so that definitely helped on some of my runs, despite not needing any of them for my final attempt, go figure. But with the final boss defeated, Joshua comes clean with the whole truth. He was the composer the entire time. Everything was orchestrated by him. These whole games as of late have all been a part of a bet between Kitanji and him. Joshua got tired of Shibuya being a bad influence on other grounds and thinking its rotten people aren't worth existing anymore, so he decided to destroy it. But Kitanji and his love for this town made a deal with Joshua that he'd have one month to change Shibuya, make its people better and be rid of the selfishness plaguing the town. But if Joshua won the bet, then the town would be erased as planned. As a sort of a handicap, he would choose a player from the RG to represent him, that person being Neku. He went to the RG to gather him, but Minamimoto attempted to kill Joshua while he's weaker in the RG so that he could become the new composer. This was a bit of the memory we saw before, but in actuality, Joshua did kill Neku since he needed him to become a player representing him. So in the end, if Neku won the game, then Shibuya would be destroyed, which they just accomplished. But in a fit of mercy, Joshua gives Neku one last chance. They have a duel. If Neku wins, he becomes the composer and Shibuya lives to see another day. If Joshua wins, then Shibuya is gone. In the end, despite Neku wanting to do it for Shibuya's sake, he can't bring himself to kill a friend, with Joshua shooting him in the next moment. But little did he know that hesitation and decision to see Joshua as a friend, despite it all, is what triggered a change of heart in him. Not only only did he spare Shibuya, but he brought Neku and friends back to life, with Neku waking up in the Scramble Crossing, flesh and blood once again. A week passes, and he reflects on how much the Reapers game changed him for the better, and of the people who caused that. He addresses Joshua too, saying that he doesn't forgive him yet, but he trusts him. He did save them all, and took care of things. The game ends with him high-fiving all his new friends as they meet for the first time as flesh and blood, leaving his headphones and old ways behind him, showing that in the end, the world begins with you. What a freaking game, man. This is legitimately one of Square Enix's finest. Not only is the game fun to play, but it has an incredible message that I feel literally everyone needs to hear, especially in this day and age of social media and online presence. The world has become such a toxic and painful place thanks to the advancement of the internet, so the message this game provides can really help people be able to properly deal with these kinds of things and inspire a new way of life. Pain is inevitable no matter how you live. But don't let pain be a reason you shut your heart out from everything. Use that pain to grow who you are. Learn how to move past it and use that life experience to march onward to the future you want. Let your experiences allow you to become your true self and only then will you see how far your horizons can be, where your world can truly begin. I wanted to end this video with a rant of how amazing this game is, but how terrible Square Enix is for not promoting this series, and how doing so caused it to go nowhere near as far as it could. I wanted to, I really wanted to end it this way. I had it all typed out, but I couldn't. The World Ends With You is too great of an experience for me to end this video on such a negative note. So while all of what I said about the series' lack of marketing is true, I'll pick my battles wisely and save that rant for another day. So instead, let me end this off on a positive note. The World Ends With You is one of my favorite games of all time, not only for its incredible story or its really fun gameplay, but for its message and how it chooses to tell it. I don't like it when I feel like some of those games are trying to 
preach to me in order to get their message across. This game does it in a more subtle way to where it's so gradual that it just kind of dawns on you late into the game. And after that, it just makes the ending that much more sweet. Though I will say now, I'm aware I haven't mentioned the added story from the new Switch version of the game. I know it's vital for a huge part of why things are the way they are in the sequel, Neo The World Ends With You, but I find it better narratively to bring it up in that game's video, since I won't have to withhold certain info at that point. So with that, if you haven't already, please play The World Ends With You. It's not the most accessible game, thanks Square, but it's still one I beg they'll port to other consoles and PC at some point, or at least at the very least, you all find the easiest way to experience it yourself if you catch my drift. I won't drag this on for any longer, we've got some more adventures ahead of us. I said it in a recent live stream, but my goals for the remainder of 2022 is to have this video go up alongside ones for Nier Replicant, Octopath Traveler, and Neo The World Ends With You. And if we have time, I'd like to get Kingdom Hearts 2 done, but it's not a priority. Next year's main series will tackle our Final Fantasy, Trails, and Fire Emblem. I'll be going in order for Final Fantasy and Trails, but for Fire Emblem, it'll be a bit different. I'll likely start with Three Houses since it's popular and I love that game, but never did the Black Eagles route. So after that video, I'd want to ask you all which to do after it. So we'll just hop around the series wherever you all want to go since I practically no experience with this franchise. I'm also going to be streaming games that aren't priorities for videos like Triangle Strategy, courtesy of Square Enix. It'll get its video eventually, but because I'm so booked for the time being, streaming it just seems like fun. Actually, by the time this video is live, we'll probably have already done a few streams of it. You can catch the playlist in the description box below. But thank you all so much for watching. My name is Kingdom Ace, and remember to subscribe to the channel if you're excited for more, and I will see you all in the next video.